Shabbat shalom. You know, the word government, government, huh? Is because uh, we want to deal with the passages in scripture that most Christians or believers submit to to stay under the influence of their governments, even at the expense of their Christianity. But the Bible says we are to submit to government. So we want to we want to confront that and find out if the scriptures do say that. The Bible may say it, but I don't think the scriptures of the Tanakh will say that, <laughs> which we'll find out from the original Hebraic perspective. Amen. Amen. So let's let's start in um, some foundational scriptures to make us circumspect about the correction in Romans thirteen that the translation records concerning submitting to governing authorities in Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2. First covenant scriptures that confirms the understanding that the correct translation brought back to us. Uh, because in 1 Peter 2, 13, it talks about uh, submitting to every institution of man and even, uh, you know, governors or even kings, it says. And, and Hebraically, we know a king is just one who listens to differing views and gives counsel and advice. That's, that's it. So it gives us a different perspective about governing or ruling uh, parties or even a king, right? So, and to confirm it, Yahweh gave me these passages in the first covenant to go to review, and we'll start in uh, Exodus chapter 18. So in Exodus chapter 18, that is uh, the time of Moses' journey when he was bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, and he ran into his father-in-law. So I'll start at verse 17. It says, So Moses, his relation tie, his father-in-law, said to him, the thing that you do is not functional. It's not being purposeful. Verse 18, both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out, for this thing is too much for you. You're not able to form it by yourself. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel and powers. Yahweh will be with you. Stand before powers for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to powers and you will teach them the statutes and the laws and the instructions and show them the way in which they must walk and the work which they must do. Moreover, you will select from all the people able men such as fearing powers, men of truth, hating covetousness. I like to say that in Hebrew. Moreover, you will select from all the people Anshe Chayil, Men of enabling abilities, men who are able to enable others, men who use their resources to enable others, their soldiers, warriors, and um, Yireh Elohim, uh, men who fear powers, Anshe Emet, men of truth, Anshe Emet, truth. The verb root of truth is aman, amen. So everybody speaks Hebrew when they say amen. That's a straight Hebrew word, and it's the root word for truth. And the function of it is to rely and depend, to rely and depend. So anshe emet, men of truth, sone batza, hating covetousness, hating greed. So those are the type of men you are to have on your board, or on your staff. Anshe Chayil, Yire Elohim, Anshe Emet, Sone Batsa. Right? Men who are like soldiers with you, who will use their wealth to enable others. Men who fear powers. Men of truth. They 
rely and depend upon powers and what he says and what he has established and what he has put you in the context of. Men who keep it real, huh? And they hate greed. They hate greed. They cannot be bought. So they won't take bribes. And they're not into money. They know money and riches and wealth. The purpose of it is to establish Yahweh's covenant in the earth to meet needs and right wrongs for humanity and take care of the poor, right? Those are the type of men you are to have on your staff or on your board or on your team. That was a by the way, by the way. Okay. So Moses' father-in-law, his relation tie, told him those type of men. And he says, and place such, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Yeah, and that word rulers is mashal, right? So they are the ones to oversee different, you know, numbers of men as they are trustworthy to handle, to determine the role and character of those groups of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Amen. And he says, verse 22, and let them judge the people at all times. Shafat, let them always set things in order with and in the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they will bring to you, but every small matter they themselves will set in order or judge. Shafat, so it will be easier for you for they will bear the burden with you. Okay, so here's the first type of if I can use the word again, governing setup, or I'll, I'll, I'll use administration. Here's, here's this, that's a better, because I don't like the word govern, because uh, government means um, mind control from the Latin. So here, here's the first administrative setup to ensure that the nation's disputes will be handled or set in order. Amen? Because that was the only reason why administrations were set up. This is functional. Okay, now go to 1 Samuel chapter 8. So we, we all know the story where Israel demanded a king. Right? In 1 Samuel chapter 7 verse 15 it says, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. You know, he set things in order when there was a need to. Uh, and verse 16, he went from year to year on a circuit in Bethel, in Gilgal, and Mitzvah. And he judged Israel in all those places. But he always returned to Ramah, for his home was there. And there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar to Yahweh. So Ramah is a, uh, a high place. So he lived on a hill overlooking the nation, those who he was judging. So in chapter 8, uh, because you know, he was so busy, he didn't have time with his sons to train them up in the way, <laughs> like Proverbs 6.22 says, right? So it says in verse 3, it says, But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. You see? Their father was a leader, and, but their father didn't have time to train them up in the way of uh, Anshe Chayil, Yireh Elohim, Anshe Emet, Sone Batsa. Okay? Um, verse 4, And then the, all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Here it is. And then we know Yahweh told Samuel, look, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. In verse 7, he told them that. Right. But they said, verse 6, give us a king to judge us. Right. And Yahweh told Samuel, let them know. 
what the consequences are for him answering their request. And Samuel told them. And then uh, verse 20, verse 19, it says, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, No, but we will have a king over us. Verse 20, that we also may be like all the nations. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So here's the first mention of an acquiescence by Yahweh for the nation wanting a ruler. Well, actually the first time was when they were at Mount Sinai and Yahweh wanted to be intimate with the whole nation like he was with Moses, but they rejected that. They said, no, Moses, you be our mediator between Yahweh and us and we'll do whatever he tells you to tell us. <laughs> so here you have historically the reason why administrations are set over men, you see. And the purpose was for the correct translation of Romans 13 gives to us. It was just to settle disputes that would arise amongst the community, amongst the congregation, amongst the nation. You know, confirming that any administration that's set up over men was temporary and only to settle disputes, not for man to rule over man, which will eventually lead to his own dysfunction, his own hurt, like Ecclesiastes says. So, and why is it that man doesn't want to rule or govern himself? Why does he need to be governed if he is made in the image of the creator of heaven and earth. I refuse to let another man stay dependent upon me to govern their life because he's made in the image of Yahweh. You are made in the image of Yahweh, dude. I ain't doing uh -uh. I'm not going to try and take the place of Yahweh in your life. I am not the creator of heaven and earth. I'm a son of the creator of heaven and earth. I am powers, as Psalms 82 says, but I'm a son of the most high power. I'm submitted to the most high powers. Yeah, and I, th and I think I, I asked a question. It was rhetorical, but why men think that they need uh, administrations over them to tell them what to do is because they don't want to be responsible for their actions. They don't want to make decisions that they'll have to be accountable for and responsible to. That's the only reason. You follow? Make sense? A man. Isaiah chapter 9, a prophecy of uh, the kingdom of Yahweh being established. In uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the rule of superior power, the Hebrew word is the Misra, Mem, Sin, Resh, He, the verb root is Sarah, which we did a word study on that in previous upload. And uh, it has to do with uh, to rule, to exert superior power, right? Exert power, rule. Man, everything about the Hebrew is action oriented it's not passive like linear languages it's active right so even this word sarah to rule right exerting power you're not just sitting on power you're putting it in effect you're exerting it amen so he says and the government will be upon his shoulders so we know the word government is a modern word from the latin Government is a gubernare mente. Mente is mind in Latin. Gubernare in Latin is to control. So it's mind control. Government means mind control. Do you want your mind controlled by anyone other than Yahweh Elohim? <laughs> Scripture says in Proverbs, submit your ways to 
Yahweh, and he will establish your thoughts. Right? So thoughts either come from above or below. If it comes from below, that's the enemy, Satan, the adversary of your souls. Amen? So he says, and the rule of superior power will be upon his shoulder, verse 6, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty Powers, right? Everlasting Father. So this is saying that child will be called the Everlasting Father. Hello, people. Sorry, Trinity, right? And it says Prince of Peace, right? Sar Shalom, Sar Shalom, Ruler of Peace, okay? The Hebrew mind also can interpret this, which gives further confirmation actively as, uh, and his identity will be summoned, will be, you know, it'll be observed to be beyond the norm, right? And his counsel of instruction, you see? And just powers of might, might of powers, mighty powers, right? And uh, everlasting Father. So his identity reflects the same. Wonderful, it's counsel for us, is power above whatever power is trying to subjugate you, and the producer forever, right? And the ruler of harmonizing things back to the original yeah and then verse 7 says of the increase of his rule of superior power toward shalom toward harmonizing everything back to the original way before the fall right there will be no end to that you follow me when this is when this kingdom is established when this rule of superior power upon the shoulders of our redeemer is established it will continue until you follow so that's that's there's that's indefinite amen, amen. so that's a foundation in isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 right so we know yeshua hamashiach was the fulfillment of that is that correct and also we know in 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 daniel it talks about that kingdom that will be set up will be given to the saints of the most high and they will possess it. It will not be given to other people. And they will possess it forever. Okay. So it lets us know that when he sets it up, there will be no interruptions of it. There will be no interruptions of it. Okay. Because if that's the case, then a lot of these prophecies and um, post, mid, and pre-tribulation doctrines, you'd have to revisit if this... Truth is an absolute, which it is, you follow? And other end-time prophecies, you follow? So, praise Yahweh for this understanding. Okay, now, so it says, the rule of superior power will be upon his shoulders, the, the government. But we know Yahweh doesn't rule by mind control because Yahweh invites us to partner with him in our salvation, in him granting us essence of existence. He is the source of our existence. And he grants us the essence of his, which is quality. You follow? And it's a, it's a partnership. You know, it's a covenant agreement. Yeah? Uh, a, a covenant agreement, which we understand what covenant is now uh, from the original perspective. Okay, so in Romans chapter 13... This is the verse in 1 Peter that misaligns with being granted essence of existence those who are supposed to be Yahweh's people. Okay? So chapter 13 of Romans, it says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Let every soul submit to the governing authorities. Now we know the word governing has problems, but we understand, right? So this word in Hebrew is uh, rasha, resh, shin, he. 
Rasha is, uh, it means arbitrary powers. So it says, let every soul, this is the correct translation. This is the uh, concrete English translation from SOPW, the scriptures of the way, right? From Tanakh assemblies. Okay, dope. So it says, let every soul be subject to arbitrary powers, to the arbitrary powers, for there is no authority except from powers, and the authorities that exist are appointed by powers. So the word arbitrary just means to settle disputes. So they're not consistent. They only gather, arbitrary powers only gather to settle disputes. Not to, what we understand, to govern continuously the masses or people. This is good. Salah. <laughs> so this is a why Hebrew, why you have to have the correct translation. So that you don't misalign yourself with being harmonized with Yahweh on a path that the world has deceitfully have you traveling on. Okay? So let's now go ahead and read this, and it's going to make sense with the correct understanding. So let every soul be subject to arbitrary powers, for there is no there is no powers except from power, right? There is no authority except from powers. And the authorities that exist are appointed by powers, by Yahweh Elohim, right? Okay, verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists the authority, the authority that Yahweh set up, right? The arbitrary powers, the ones that he set up to settle disputes among you, right? Whoever resists those authorities resists the ordinance of powers. And those who resist will bring judgment upon themselves. <laughs> Verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to works that are purposeful. Good. Told. Being purposeful. But to dysfunctional works. But to evil works. Right? Do you want to be unafraid of the authority that Yahweh set up? Do what is purposeful. What is functional. And you will have praise from the same. You'll be praised instead of judged. For he, he, who, that arbitrary power that Yahweh set up, right, is Yahweh's minister, is power's minister to you for function, to bring you back to purpose. Guess what that word is in the Hebrew? It's shemesh. <laughs> shemesh. What is shemesh, people? Shemesh is the Hebrew word for son. What is the function of the son? To serve as intended. So this is that word. In the Hebrew, verse 4, for he is Yahweh's servant who will serve as intended. And the intention in this regard is to settle your disputes. If you do dysfunction, be afraid. Right? Because he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is Yahweh's servant and and an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil or dysfunction or who breaks the harmony of things, right? Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for your conscience sake so that you can have the peace and the joy of Yahweh inside. You follow? For your conscience sake. Because he is Yahweh's servant Minister, serving as intended to settle disputes between you. Verse 5, therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Because of this, you also pay taxes. Right? Because they're set up temporarily just to settle disputes. They're arbitrary powers, not what we understand government to be in our perverse generation. Okay, a lot of people didn't know government meant mind control. Everybody who submits to it, they've been bewitched. Mind control. That's why the public school system, they force you to do that so they can indoctrinate you to submit to their society and way of living, which makes you, which we put up upload, employer, employee, is slavery. Right? But just because you're getting a salary, you don't think you're a slave. 
and nobody's free. Whenever you have to go get a, approval to do that which is natural right, you're not free. Whenever you have to go get approval to build a house to shelter you and your family, get approval from who? You're not free, you're a slave. Whenever you have to get approval to get married after you've found a prudent woman of Yahweh, and then you go into a man to get approval to marry that, ah, you only get approval from the father of that beautiful young virgin woman. And then whatever dowry he asks from you, you give because he kept her pure. <laughs> She's an asset. Amen? We understand. For this is why you pay taxes. For they are Yahweh's powers, ministers, servants, attending continually to this very thing. To make sure all disputes are settled so that men can live in harmony with themselves and creation, which is a result of being harmonized with your Creator. Amen? Render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due? Listen, that's to those arbitrary powers that are there for the time of settling the disputes. And then once it's settled, then they go back to their, under their vine and fig tree and enjoy their families and live their lives harmoniously. You understand? Which, by the way, they would be the elders of the communities, the elders of the clans, the elders of the nation. Amen? Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, the tax thing. First, let me go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, because this is the other verse that they say we have to submit to government. You know, ignorantly relying on unreliable knowledge, which the scripture says is a fool. Huh? Verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 2. Therefore, submit yourselves to every institution of man for the master's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to rulers as to those who are sent by him, by the king, for the punishment of evildoers, dysfunctional workers, and for the praise of those who, we explained it in Romans 13, for the praise of those who are being purposeful. Yeah? sent by the king to praise those who are being purposeful in his realm of rulership, yeah? Verse 15, For this is the will of powers of Yahweh, that by doing good or being purposeful, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using your freedom as a cloak for wickedness, but as bondservants of powers. Bond servant is a voluntarily submitted individual to whoever he wants to voluntarily submit to. But we are voluntary servants of our creator, of our powers. We are children of the most high power. We are powers, Psalms 82, and we are children of the most high powers. Okay? And so the power that we are is above any other power on earth. Amen? Amen? Both seen or unseen. So he says, honor all, love the brethren, yeah? Fear powers and honor who he put in charge. Okay? Now, because he put them in charge, the word mashal is the word that is lived out by Yahweh's ministers or servants. Mashal is, is to rule by uh, determining character, yeah? The role of a created thing, right? Determining role or character. That's how we're to rule, you, you know, and we understand the uh, interaction of elements that bring about an individual response or a situation or scenario, amen? Okay, it's clear? Amen. Now, in Matthew... 22, here's a passage that the Pharisees tried to trap Yeshua, who came with a rule of superior power upon his shoulders, uh, 
to set up his kingdom, right? So they, they tried to uh, entrap him. So in Matthew twenty two seventeen it says, Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? That's SOTW, Concrete English Translated Correction. They say Caesar, but it, Hebrew is Caesar. Caesar is a, with a Q. <laughs> Verse 18, but Yeshua, recognizing, he perceived, he knew their wickedness, and he said, why do you test me, you actors? <laughs> the word hypocrite is actually a transliterated uh, word from the Greek in English. It's actually a Greek word, the translation of it, hypokritos. It's not the meaning. The meaning is the actor. <laughs> right? So he says, well, why do you test me, you actors? What does that say about Hollywood people, huh? <laughs> and, and Hollywood actors and stars, huh? A bunch of liars, huh? Pretenders. Verse 19. He says, show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. He said, show me the tax money. So they brought to him a denarius. And he said to them, whose image... An inscription is this, right? They said to him, Caesars, right? Caesars. And he said to them, okay, we'll pay, therefore, to Caesar the things that are Caesars. Because he, he created that coin, you know what I'm saying, and put his image on it, right? So he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesars, and to powers the things that are powers, right? So man can only imprint his image on a coin and he gives it to people and he wants them to submit to it and so people live their lives by that coin purchasing goods and services yeah so they're submitting to Kesar. so then then he says okay so if you want to submit to this guy then you render to him what he requires of you if you live your life according to that and then he says and to powers the things that are Powers, Yahweh Elohim, right? So, whose image or inscription are you? Yahweh's. We were made in His image and likeness. We lost His likeness, but now we're harmonizing back with Him. We're being returned to the likeness, but we are, in, we are His image in the earth. We don't have to make, put our images on inanimate objects to get subjects. So Yeshua told them, when they heard these things, they marveled and they left him and went away because they, they knew what he was talking about. But believers today don't understand that. You want to submit to the decrees of Caesar? Then you will be subject to the world's consequences and whatever they put on you. But if you submit to Yahweh Elohim, to powers, the most high powers who created you and made you in his image, guess what? I did an upload about commandments. When you obey his command, then he bequeaths to you authority without losing control. He delegates to you authority without him losing control. So that makes you an ambassador of his, removing you from having to subject yourself to the decrees of Caesar because you submit to powers, to Yahweh. And so therefore you have diplomatic immunity and don't have to pay taxes don't have to submit to their decrees because you're functioning in his kingdom, which is above all powers, dominions, and authority. Praise Yahweh. Huh? He's mighty. That's good stuff. Now, let me clarify also, even their setup that you have found yourself born into, but now hopefully you are coming out from underneath the fraudulence of it, these governments, right? So we had this letter that we put out. It's a, a rallying cry for believers to wake up and start walking as children of the light. Huh? And within it, it gives the understanding of uh, how you have legal authority to do so and not even offend these uh, fraudulent governments huh? because they were set up from common law practices which comes from natural law which comes from 
all created things have been endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. You can never be estranged from those rights. Yeah. And, you know, rule of law, right, is, is not arbitrary power over men. Rule of law is not arbitrary power over men. We know what arbitrary power is, right? It is uh, to settle disputes. Rule of law is, is not that. Okay? Rather, rule of law is a set of contemporary rules. Right? So it should not have control over men. Because I hear politicians yell out, Wow, we must live the rule of law. Like, that's some entity. Contemporary rules is in your generation what is now. You follow me? It has changed from King Arthur's time. Because <laughs> everybody was agrarian then. Now, we're in this so-called modern age of technology and science. So we change the, the rules to fit our context of existence. Right? So the contemporary rules. Right? And uh, I heard a gentleman say this. I, I want to say it now. Just we, we know that modernization and uh, development is showing itself unsustainable. Yeah, because it's at the expense of people groups, mm -hmm. of nature, yeah. and animal life. Yeah? yeah, so it's not sustainable. And that's why under the guise of the Great Reset, they, these guys know that. And that's why they want to call the populations by billions, right? So you know what the answer simply is? For man and his science and technology and all that type of stuff? Mm -hmm. Stop developing. Why do you need to develop continuously? I mean, it's showing too many ill side effects from your, from your development endeavors. Too many side effects. So stop it. And let's go back to being in harmony with nature. Let's go back to the agrarian lifestyle where families were producers instead of consumers, which is what modern development has brought about. And dependency. Yeah, don't go back to... It's always been there. It's, never, it's nothing to go back to. It's, been, it's there waiting for you to harmonize with it, with nature, with creation. And the witness is there everywhere you go. Once you leave the city, you see creation in harmony with itself. Huh? Beautiful. <laughs> Sunrise, sunset, cloud formations, right? Rain, snow. The beauty of just... ah. Creation is awesome, and it brings serenity. And it's like, hello, I'm waiting for you to come and... <laughs> and that's what Yahweh sovereignly did with this pandemic. They stopped everything so that creation can remind you that it's been here, still here, and will host you according to its purpose, right? Because 2020... Development stopped. And what was, what was happening in certain locations on the earth? Animal life came back. Fishes. People can see the sky. The smog was gone. And in China, they were reminded about blue skies <laughs> and the warmth of the sun. You follow me? Rivers were replenished. Lakes and animal life began to flourish again. Amen? Amen? So, and constitutions are just uh, social contracts, theories, right? Social contract theories with humanity, right? And people who submit to constitutions, they're surrendering their rights for security. Yeah? It's a social contract theory because it doesn't work. It's a theory. It don't work. <laughs> it sounds good. People submit to it, but too many side effects, too many problems in it. And they have to come up with more regulations and rules because mm -hmm. because of the side effects that occur because it doesn't work. And then they, then they have big libraries full of just rules and regulations, thousands, hundreds. And then they say, then they say, you can't understand that. So let me apply some, assign somebody to you who do study it and know it. And then now you want to understand what they're saying because they're talking legalese in a language that like, uh, foolishness and it keeps changing 
As people wake up to find the fraudulency, it changes to protect the exposure of it. Yeah. <laughs> Always <laughs> editing. <laughs> That's what keeps, yeah, policymakers, fake arbitrary powers busy to stay ahead of being caught. And then they tax you more, right? Yeah, so simply, you know, constitutions were uh, to be accepted. They were uh, common law procedural implements, right? And uh, common law is just reason from the scriptures. <laughs> Scriptural reasoning written down constitution, right? So all political power is inherent in the people and uh, governments or arbitrary powers are founded on their authority and instituted for their benefit. That's the initial purpose, right? But uh, because the scripture says in Ecclesiastes, uh, there comes a time when one man will rule or control against another man to his own dysfunction, that eventually happens. You know, they, a man will go off into ruling to his own hurt. And then, you know, they came up with the word democracy. The ideal of democracy is universal equality, equality, equality. That's why they, you know, they want everybody to have to get the same pay, have the same kind of house. You know what I'm saying? Nobody's above the other. Removing individuality. And uh, the ideal of a republic is individual freedom. You follow me? Which is what the constitutional theory is supposed to protect. The freedom of the individual. Which is what we read in Romans 13. Arbitrary powers, not government. Arbitrary powers are just set up temporarily to settle disputes. To protect your freedoms. You know, and a, a crime is uh, defined as the violation of your person or your property. That's it. If you can accuse no one of hurting you or destroying or stealing your property, no crimes have been committed. Amen? Now, let me say this. Democracy always degenerates to dictatorship, which promises government guaranteed equality and security, but delivers nothing but poverty and serfdom for the people it robs and rules. Using America as an example, America was founded as a constitutional republic. Republic just means, you know, the public, you know, the, looking out the interest for the public, right? So republic is return to the public, the authority that uh, we said all political power is, is inherent in the people, right? Mm -hmm. So America was founded as a constitutional republic to safeguard the freedoms of the people against the tyranny of democracy or of one-man dictatorship. Amen? Oh, and by the way, you know, initially they, they had common law courts, common law courts, which were arbitrary powers, right? They were settling disputes between two affected parties regarding matters of injury, theft, or breach of contract, violating covenant, right? Anything outside these categories are victimless crimes involving no injury party, no injured party, and have no business being called law, right? Now, the word extortion, right? The word extortion is, you know, the property is taken away from the victim with his consent, though it is unwilling. That's extortion. Property is taken away from the victim with his consent, though it is unwilling. Right? Theft is taking a property without consent and against the owner's will. Okay? Now, so Yahweh said, for this you pay taxes, right? And we know Yeshua in Luke 23, Luke 23, 1, it says, then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilatos. Pilatos, right? Pilate, right? Verse 2. And they began to accuse him, Yeshua, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, right? Saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. So that confirms 
what Yeshua was saying in Matthew 22, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and render unto power what belongs to power. And Yeshua was taken before Pilate, Pilatos, and accused by those who took him before, took Yeshua before him, said this guy in 23.2 refuses to pay taxes to Caesar, <laughs> Caesar, right? So, and also, you know, in, in Esther, you can research this on your own, in Esther chapter 3, verse 8, and in Acts 16, verse 20, confirming that the Israelites did not pay taxes. Uh, in Acts 16, 20. Right? And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Right? So, in the scriptures, you know, in Ecclesiastes, and wherever you see the word oppression, that is the word asak, ayin, sin, kof, which they translate as oppression. And it means to uh, make, a, make a legal claim to withhold another's rights or property, to grab illegally or taking, right? So that's in Deuteronomy 24, verse 14 and 15, a commandment of Yahweh you will not do. It's in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 31. It's in Mal Malachi chapter 3, verse 5. And it's in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. This Oppression is a no-no in Scripture. This extortion, this income taxes, that is income taxes, okay? And usury, what banks do, interest. Usury is interest. The Hebrew word is nashak, nun, shin, final ka, right? Nun, shin, final ka. That, what they translate as usury or interest, is a no-no also, and it, the Hebrew word, is to bite or cause a loss. That's why the scriptures is against interest, usury, is against extortion, income taxes. Because usury and interest causes a loss. Extortion, you are being illegally taken from. Right? Because here is the definition of income in the Constitution. Here it is. The definition of income in the Constitution was given in the Eisner versus Montgomery case, right? Gains from corporate activity is not labor. Gains from corporate activity is not labor. Okay? So those of you who work for corporations <laughs> or businesses, right? Labor is your private property. I will say it again. Labor is your private property. Okay? Chief among such contracts is that of personal employment by which labor and other services are exchanged. Right? Personal employment is where your labor or other services are exchanged for money or other forms of property. That's Coppedge versus Kansas, 236 U.S. 1, 14, 1914. This is legal cases, right? So the definition of income is not labor, okay? So for America, in Peck versus Lowe, Peck versus Low, I quote, the 16th Amendment did not extend Congress's taxing power to any new or accepted subjects. Again, Peck versus Low, quote, the 16th Amendment did not extend the Congress's taxing power to any new or accepted subjects. In other words, if you were not taxable before the 16th Amendment, you are not taxable after the 16th Amendment, right? That's law. Lower courts are putting people in jail. Lower courts have to be submitted 
to the Supreme Courts. And the Constitution of the United States and Constitution of any country is an instrument of common law procedure. Amen? And common law procedure is scriptural reasoning applied. Like Yahweh says in Romans 13, he set up arbitrary powers, individuals to settle disputes among the people. Temporary. That's it. Not governing tyrannically. Amen? Is that clear? We have enough information on that? Okay. Now, taxes in a region, let me just skip, put, say this. Uh, well, then, you know, we, we pay taxes uh, when we buy goods and services, huh? And that's enough. And the community or the nation, the country, can survive off of excise tax. Excise tax are taxes, business taxes, you know what I'm saying? So let me give a little simple example of, we have a community here, right? So someone comes to our community, they see a need for something, they can provide the need, and they say, hey, can I come and provide this need to your community? And uh, the elders say, yeah, no problem. But because you're going to make money and profit off of my people, you have to give us a percentage of it because we're allowing you to become prosperous and wealthy off our people. And they say, okay, no problem. And so that's excise tax. Eh? So then the elders with that money, they, when it reaches a certain amount, they divide it, the percentage of it to the people who made this business thrive. You follow me? And then there's harmony in that, isn't it? And everybody is win-win. <laughs> That's the way it's supposed to be. You follow? And uh, anything outside of that, selfish motives have kicked in, which will lead to power-hungry individuals who will subjugate to slavery the people. Amen? Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.